All right, I've got uh, part two of the uh, HM1 Advancement Review for the September 2018 exam. So let's go over those uh, SSIC codes, 6000 Medicine, and if we're staying right there in 6000, we're going to be General Admin as it falls into Medicine, our 6100, again, that's Physical Fitness, 6200, Preventative Medicine, 63, our General Medicine, 64 through 65, our Special Field, 66, Dentistry, and then 67, our uh, Equipment and Supplies, all the way through 68. What term describes written guidance that informs and instructs Navy personnel by communicating policy and procedures used in the performance of their duties? Right. informs and instructs Navy personnel by communicating policy and procedures used in the performance of their duties, that's a directive. What instruction is the Navy Directives Management Program? What instruction is the Navy's Directives Management Program? That's OPNAV Instruction 5215.17 Alpha, 5215.17 Alpha, OPNAV Instruction. What are the different types of directives? What are the different types of directives? The different directives we have, instructions, notices, and change transmittals. Instructions, notices, and change transmittals, those are the different types of directives. What form is used to officially cancel a form? What form is used to cancel a form? That's a DD-67, the Form Processing Action Request. DD-67, the Form Processing Action Request. What is the official font for Navy directives? What is the official font for Navy Directives? We're going to use Times New Roman, size 12. Times New Roman, size 12. What type of directive is used to establish, implement, or revise policy? What type of directive is used to establish, implement, or revise policy? That's the instructions. What type of directive is used to establish or change organizational structure? What type of directive is used to establish or change organizational structure? That's going to be a notice. What type of directive is used for change of command or educational or promotional opportunities? Change of commands, educational or promotion opportunities, we're going to do that with notices. What type of directive assigns mission, function, or tasks? Mission, functions, or tasks, that's going to be instructions. How long do notices remain in effect? How long is a notice in effect for? For one year. How often must all Navy instructions be reviewed? How often must all Navy instructions be reviewed? We got to review those guys annually. What form is utilized to review instructions? What form is utilized to review instructions? The OPNAV 5215 slant 40. OPNAV 5215 slant 40, that's going to be used to review instructions. After how many years must an instruction be revised? After how many years must an instruction be revised? After five years. What occurs if by the five-year anniversary date of an instruction, it's considered still to be valid and doesn't require revision? Well, if after five years it's still valid, we're going to go ahead and reissue the instruction under the next alphabetical suffix and provide the new date that we reissued on it. How long do inner service joint uh, instructions remain in effect if the Navy is the lead service? How long do inner service joint instructions remain in effect if Navy is the lead service? For 10 years. 10 years on those. How long do inner service joint instructions remain in effect when the Navy is not the lead service? When the Navy is not the lead service, we're just going to follow the lead service's age requirements. Manual type instructions will be canceled if not revised in how many years? 10 years. After 10 years, manual type instructions are supposed to be canceled if they're not revised. How many instruction extensions can be approved? How many, how many instruction extensions can be approved? Two. We can, uh, we can do two extensions on an instruction and they cannot be longer than one year. Who exercises overall management of the Navy's directives program man, or management program? Who exercises overall management of the Navy directives management program? That's going to be the CNO. What instruction is the Navy's guidelines concerning pregnancy and parenthood? The OPNAV 6000.1C. OPNAV 6000.1C, Navy's guidelines concerning pregnancy and parenthood. At how many weeks must a CO approve off-base housing for pregnant service women? At how many weeks must a CO approve off-base housing for pregnant service women? They must do it at 20 weeks. Within how much time must a pregnant service woman notify their CO after confirmation of the pregnancy? 
no later than two weeks. Okay, no later than two weeks. Once a, a pregnant service woman has uh, confirmed their pregnancy, that's when they got to notify the CO. Pregnant service women are exempt from standing at attention and parade rest for longer than how many minutes? Service a uh, pregnant uh, pregnant service woman shouldn't stand at parade rest or attention for longer than 15 minutes. How often are service uh, or pregnant service women offered breaks? while in the last trimester, and how long are the breaks? Pregnant service women are gonna be offered breaks every four hours for 20 minutes, and they should be authorized to put their feet up. How many hours of work a week are pregnant service women limited to in the last trimester? They're limited to 40 hours per week. What immunizations are contraindicated for pregnant service women? What immunizations are contraindicated in pregnant service women are live vaccines, right? Our live virus vaccines, which will include things like live influenza, MMR, varicella, BCG, smallpox, and yellow fever. And then we should keep in mind that these should not be administered in anybody who's planning to get pregnant. We ask hey, if, you're, if you're planning to get pregnant the next three months, you know, as a screening for these live ones. And if the, if the answer is yes to that, then we shouldn't administer these vaccines. Pharmacologically, the nerve agents are known as what type of inhibitors, right? Nerve agents are known as cholinesterase inhibitors. What are your nerve agents? What are the nerve agents covered in your Corman manual? All right, the nerve agents covered in the Corman manual, VX, Taboon, Sarin, Somen, and Cyclosarin. What medication is given for nerve agent poisoning and acts by removing the nerve agent from the enzyme acetylcholinesterase? What medication removes the nerve agent from the enzyme acetylcholinesterase? That's your 2-PAM chloride, 2-PAM chloride. What medication is found in the convulsive antidote nerve agent in the canna? All right, you can find 10 milligrams of diazepam in your convulsive antidote nerve agent. What is the drug of choice for treating nerve agent poisoning? What is the drug of choice for treating nerve agent poisoning? That is atropine. What medications are found in the Mark I antidote kit? What medications are found in the Mark I added, uh, antidote kit? You got two milligrams of atropine and 600 milligrams of 2-PAM chloride. What chemical agents are cyanide-based and disrupt oxygen utilization at the cellular level? What chemical agents are cyanide-based and disrupt oxygen at the cellular level? Those are your blood agents. What odor does hydrogen cyanide have? What odor does hydrogen cyanide have? They say it smells like bitter almonds. Patients exposed to mustards may remember what odor? They're gonna remember garlic, mustard, or horseradish when exposed to the mustards. What odor does lewisite have? Lewisite smells similar to geraniums. What odor is phosgene said to have? They say phosgene smells like new mown hay. What chemical agent would you suspect in a patient with rapid, shallow, labored breathing, a painful cough, cyanosis, frothy sputum, and a low blood pressure? This is going to be your pulmonary agents. What bacteria causes anthrax? What is the bacteria that causes anthrax? That's Bacillus anthracis. Bacillus anthracis is a causative uh, organism for anthrax. What bacteria causes plague? What bacteria causes plague? Yersinia pestis. What bacteria causes tularemia? Tularemia is called by Francella tularensis. What are the three types of anthrax? The three types of anthrax are going to be cutaneous, pulmonary, and gastrointestinal. What might you expect to see on the chest x-ray of a patient suffering from inhalation anthrax? That chest x-ray is probably going to show medial stinal widening due to lymphadenitis. The lymph nodes, the helar lymph nodes in your mediastinum are all going to get swollen. What, are the, what is the first line of treatment for anthrax? What is the first line of treatment for anthrax? We're going to give you ciprofloxin or doxycycline. What are the three types of plague? What are the three types of plague? We've got pneumonic, bubonic, and septicemic. What type of plague can be spread from person to person? That is pneumonic plague that can be spread person to person. What disease is also known as rabbit fever? Rabbit fever is tularemia. What is the most common form of plague? 
The most common form of plague is bubonic. What type of plague is spread by flea bites? Again, that's bubonic. What are the primary antibiotics when treating plague? Your primary antibiotics for plague are going to be streptomycin and gentamicin. What biological agent is a neuroparalytic that blocks acetylcholine release from the peripheral nerves? Biological agent that is a neuroparalytic, that's your botulinum toxin. What is the most toxic substance known? The most toxic substance in the world, again, is botulinum. Right? What are the four types of botulism? What are the four types of botulism? You've got foodborne, infant, wound, and inhalational. Where is ricin derived from? Ricin comes from the bean of the castor plant. All right, let's get into uh, some uh, policy and guidelines for a sick call screener program. Who has priority enrollment in the sick call screener program? Who gets priority enrollment in the sick call screener program? That's individual augmentees or somebody that's within 180 days of transferring to an operational platform. How many hours of supervised clinical in-service training must sick call screeners receive annually? They've got to get eight hours of training annually. Who's responsible for developing and distributing a standardized sick call screener program curriculum? That's going to be Navy Med uh, Medicine Manpower Personal Training and Education Command. All right, the Navy Medicine Manpower Personal Training and Education Command. What are the requirements to be the sick call screener program director? What are the requirements to be the sick call screener program director? You've got to be a medical officer, a PA, or a nurse practitioner at or above the pay grade of 03. What are the requirements to be the sick call screener program manager? To be a sick call screener program manager, you either got to be a medical officer, a PA, a nurse practitioner, or an IDC at the rank of E7 and above. A pulse above what rate requires an immediate referral to a medical officer? A pulse above what rate requires an immediate referral to a medical officer? That's above 120 beats per minute. What respiratory rates require immediate referral to a medical officer? What respiratory rates? That's going to be above 28 or less than 12. Above 28 or less than 12. What blood pressure values require an immediate referral to a medical officer? What blood pressures are we going to be worried about? A systolic blood pressure greater than 180 and a diastolic blood pressure greater than 100. What instruction is your quality assurance program? What instruction is a quality assurance program? That's your BUMED instruction 6010.13. BUMED instruction 6010.13. What term describes an event or outcome during the process of medical or dental care in which the patient suffers a lack of improvement, injury or illness of severity greater than ordinarily experienced by patients with similar procedures or illness? That is your potentially compensable event, your PCE. What are the classifications of injury or disability? Classifications of injury or disability are none or minor, right? temporary, or long-term permanent. What classification will be considered a healed forearm fracture with loss of motion in the wrist or elbow? Healed forearm fracture with loss of motion in the wrist and elbow, that's considered long-term permanent. Fracture of a tooth during anesthesia. Fracture of a tooth during anesthesia is temporary. Fall with a resultant neurological injury. A fall with a neuro injury, that is long-term permanent. Appendectomy surgery for perforated appendix with no delay in recovery. Appendectomy surgery for perforated appendix with no delay in recovery, that's none or minor, none or minor. Falls with laceration or fracture. A fall with a laceration and fracture, we're gonna call that temporary. Loss of thumb or finger. Loss of thumb or finger, long-term permanent. Single episode of post-operative sepsis. A single episode of post-operative sepsis, that's going to be temporary. Anesthetic-related cardiac or respiratory arrest. An anesthetic-related cardiac or respiratory arrest, long-term permanent. Post-operative inadvertent retention of a foreign body. A post-operative inadvertent retention of a foreign body, long-term permanent. Delayed recovery from anesthesia, not impending overall recovery. A delayed recovery from anesthesia, not affecting the overall recovery, none or minor. Uh, incisional hernia. An incisional hernia is going to be temporary. 
misdiagnosis of a fracture that's recognized at a later date and is healing with no residual deformity, that's none or minor. Delayed union of a fracture, that's going to be temporary. How many years is quality assurance program related documentation maintained? We're going to keep that stuff on file for five years, okay? Five years for your QA stuff. What is the minimum time quality assurance inquiries and medical records related to potentially compensable events or JAG investigations got to be maintained? We only keep those guys for two years. Two years is our minimum time on that. The preceding fiscal year's annual assessment of the MTF's quality assurance program must reach BUMED by what date? We got to get the, uh, the annual assessment of the QA program to BUMED by the 15th of January every year. What are the six elements of a service member's individual medical readiness? What are the six, what are the six elements of a service member's IMR? The six elements of an IMR include your individual medical equipment, right? Things like dog tags, glasses, um, your immunizations, your laboratory studies, your dental readiness, deployment limiting conditions, whether or not you're on limb due, and PHA, all right? So the six elements of your IMR, individual medical equipment, immunizations, laboratory studies, dental readiness, deployment limiting conditions, and the PHA itself. Who are considered approved providers with authorization to review and sign PHAs? Who are approved providers that are authorized to sign and review PHAs? That's going to be your independent duty corpsman, your physicians, your nurse practitioners, and PAs. These are the guys that can sign off on PHAs. Visual acuity worse than blank requires a referral to optometry. If your visual acuity is worse than 2040, got to go see optometry. What is utilized to test distance binocular visual acuity during the PHA? What do we use to test that distal vision? We use the Snellen chart. At what age is near binocular visual acuity testing required during the PHA? At what age do we start, got to start testing your near vision? When you get to 45, right? Greater than 45 years of age. How far is a near visual acuity card held when testing your near vision? How far the near acuity cards held when testing near vision? They're held 16 inches away. If a service member requires corrective lenses, what medical equipment must be verified during the PHA? We got to make sure that you've got two pairs of glasses, that you've got protective gas mask inserts, and that you've got ballistic protective optical inserts. And then also a little side note, your, your ballistic uh, inserts, those can actually count towards one of your pairs of glasses. What immunizations are required for deployment? What immunizations are required for deployment? In order to deploy, right, non-region specific, you need hepatitis A and B, you need uh, the uh, inactivated polio vaccine, you need your Tdap, you need your MMR, and you need your influenza. Hepatitis A and B, polio, Tdap, MMR, and influenza. What is included in the readiness lab studies that require verification during your PHA? What are those labs that got to be required during PHA? We got to make sure we got your ABO blood type with RH factor. We got to make sure we, are, we got your G6PD status, your DNA specimen, and HIV. All right, ABO, G6PD, DNA, and HIV. Those are your readiness labs. What dental classifications are considered worldwide deployable? What dental classifications are worldwide deployable? That's a dental class one and two. What type of exam is your annual dental exam? Your annual dental exam is your type two exam. What three forms are used in the deployment health assessment process? What are the three forms used in the deployment health assessment process? That is your DD-2795, which is your pre-deployment health assessment, your DD-2796, your post-deployment health assessment, and then your DD-2900, that is your post-deployment health reassessment. And what chapter of the P117 would you find guidance on female specific health screenings? So first off, what's your P117? That is your manual of the medical department. What chapter would you find female specific health uh, uh, guidance for screenings? Uh, that would be chapter 15, which is the chapter on physical exams. What form is the DOD prescription? What form is your DOD prescription? That's going to be your DD-1289. DD-1289, your DOD prescription. What form is your poly prescription? Your poly prescription is your NAVMED 6710-6. NAVMED 6710-6, that's your poly script. 
What medication schedules can be stored in a locked cabinet? What medication schedules can be stored in a locked cabinet? We can only store three, four, and five, right? For our controlled substances, schedule three, four, and five can be scheduled in a locked cabinet. How many members are required to be on a controlled substance inventory board? How many members are required to be on your CSIB? Three. Three, and one of them has to be a commissioned officer. How often will the Controlled Substance Inventory Board conduct an unannounced inventory on Schedule 1 and 2 Controlled Substance? They got to do that at least quarterly, if not more frequently. CSIB's got to do an unannounced inspection at least quarterly, if not more frequently. Who's got to countersign the DOD prescription, the 1289, if it's not signed by a medical officer, a dental officer, a podiatrist, a PA, nurse practitioner, or a civilian physician employed by the armed forces? So if we if we put a controlled substance on a DD, a DD 1289, a, a DOD prescription, like for instance, if an IDC writes for that, who's got to countersign it? It's got to be countersigned by the CO. Um, how are scheduled one and two medications stored? How are your scheduled one and two medications stored? They've got to be in a safe or a vault. How often is the combination for the safe or a vault changed? It's got to be changed every six months, right? Every six months, if there's a change in custodian or there's a suspected uh, compromise. What form is used in cases of theft or significant loss of narcotics? In the case of theft or loss of narcotics, we've got to do a DEA 106, DEA form 106. Where is this DEA form, DEA form 106 going to be sent? It's going to be sent to a few places. It's going to be sent to the nearest DEA regional office. It's going to go to the BUMED pharmacy specialty leader. It's going to go to the MTF region pharmacy representative. And it's going to go to the nearest NCIS field representative. All right, so you lose some narcotics or some of your narcotics get stolen, right? That DEA 106 is going to get sent to the DEA. It's going to be sent to NCIS. And then it's also going to get sent to BUMED and the MTF region pharmacy. What organization must all MTS with organic pharmacy departments establish in order to advise the CEO on the selection and use of drugs? What organization has got to be at all MTS that got a pharmacy? You got to have a pharmacy and therapeutics committee, your P&T committee. How often will the pharmacy and therapeutics committee meet? They've got to meet at least quarterly. What text? sets the standards for the quality, purity, strength, and consistency and provides standards for medication of therapeutic usefulness and pharmaceutical necessity, right? Sets the standards for quality, purity, strength, and consistency and the standards for medications of therapeutic usefulness and pharmaceutical ne necessity. That is your United States Pharmacopoeia and National Formulary. What is a comprehensive medication inform information reference that is organized by therapeutic medication class? Comprehensive medication information re reference that is authorized by therapeutic medication class, that's going to be your drug facts and comparisons. What is an easy to use reference for clinicians and healthcare providers seeking quick and concise medication information? Right, your, uh, your easy use reference for quick, concise medication information, that's your drug information handbook. What is the most widely used text slash reference in American pharmacies? The most widely used text or reference in American pharmacies is Remington, the science and practice of pharmacy. What work is known as the Blue Bible of Pharmacy? What work is known as the Blue Bible of Pharmacy? That is your Remington, the science and practice of pharmacy. What is a fat soluble vitamin necessary for visual adaptation to darkness, right? Vitamin necessary for visual adaptation to darkness. That is vitamin A or retinol. What vitamin deficiency leads to the condition beriberi? What vitamin deficiency leads to the uh, condition beriberi? That's going to be thiamine, right? Or vitamin B1. Thiamine hydrochloride, a deficiency in that leads to beriberi. What vitamin deficiency leads to pellagra? What vitamin deficiency leads to the condition pellagra? That's going to be niacin, right, or vitamin B3. Niacin deficiency is going to lead to pellagra. Thiamine deficiency is going to lead to beriberi, right? B3 for your niacin, B1 for your thiamine. What vitamin is often used with INH, isoniazid, to prevent the development of peripheral neuritis? 
right? What do we use with INH? We do use pyridoxine uh, hydrochloride, vitamin B6. Pyridoxine hydrochloride. We always give vitamin B6 when we put somebody on INH, and we do that for when they have latent tuberculosis. Uh, what vitamin is used to treat pernicious anemia? For pernicious anemia, we're going to use cyanocobalamin or vitamin B12. Cyanocobalamin or vitamin B12 for pernicious anemia. What vitamin is used to prevent and cure scurvy? What vitamin is used to prevent and cure scurvy? That's going to be vitamin C or ascorbic acid. What vitamin deficiency leads to rickets in children? What vitamin deficiency is going to lead to rickets in children? That's your vitamin D deficiency. What vitamin deficiency leads to increase in blood clotting time? What vitamin deficiency is going to lead to an increase in blood clotting time? That's your vitamin K. All right, uh, moving on to some MedIG questions. What finding is described as a non-existent program or one that is deficient in major elements so that it does not fulfill the intent of policy. So if the MedIG is inspecting a program and they say your program is either non-existent or it does not fulfill the intent of policy, you're going to get a requirement for improvement or an RFI. What must a command respond with if they receive an RFI? Well, if a command gets an RFI, they got to submit what's called an Implementation Status Report, an ISR. What form is the ISR documented on? Your ISR is going to be documented on your OPNAV 5040 slant 2. When is the ISR due? When is the ISR due? It's going to be due right uh, within 90 days. Okay, The ISR must be submitted using your OPNAV 5040 slant 2 within 90 days after the conclusion of the MedIG. When are follow-on ISRs due? Your follow-on ISRs are going to be due every 90 days until it is deemed closed by the MedIG. And now all RFIs got to be closed within a year. So this is this instruction has been updated since the last adv advancement cycle where it said if it's open for a year, uh, letters got to go to the regional commander. Now the instruction just says all F RFIs must be closed within one year. All right, so that first ISR submitted in 90 days and then 90 days in, uh, after that got to be done within a year and it's uh the uh isr is using uh, submitted using the opnav 5040 slant 2. what med ig finding identifies a deficiency with their program that generally meets the intent of policy so if you got a deficiency but you're generally meeting the intent you're going to get a supplemental finding what term describes when the MedIG determines there are other options that may enhance a program's effectiveness? So there's no major issues, but they got ideas on how you could advance, uh, you can enhance the uh, the effectiveness of the program. That's called an opportunity for improvement. What organization has established the nationally recognized standards for patient-centered medical home or medical home port? That is the NCQA, the National Committee for Quality Assurance. Within how many, uh, how many months will a new medical home port clinic attain level one NCQA recognition? Within how many months must a uh, medical home port clinic attain level one? They got to do that in four months. After obtaining level one NCQA recognition, how many months does a medical home port clinic have to achieve level two recognition? They got to get that done in six months. Who does the commander or the, o, uh, the CEO or the OIC of an MTF notify when they believe that their clinic is ready for NCQA level two recognition? Well, they're going to reach out to their regional commander. Who will the Navy regional commander reach out to when they feel that that clinic is ready for NCQA level two recognition? They're going to reach out to BUMED and then BUMED with a representative from the NCQA will come down and inspect that, uh, that uh, clinic to see if it meets the, the standards of the NCQA and if it's considered medical home port. How many bookable hours does a clinician require to be considered a 1.0 full-time equivalent? How many bookable hours to be considered a 1.0 FTE or full-time equivalent? 36 bookable hours. What is the recommended impanelment range for a provider? What is the recommended impanelment range for a provider? 1,100 is the minimum. Uh, 1,300 is the maximum. All right, 1,100 to 1,300. What are the exceptions a home port clinic can make when providing care to a patient that is not enrolled in their home port team? Well, home port clinic can see newborns of a patient less than 60 days old or foreign or national dignitaries. 
Uh, students cannot be enrolled in Homeport if they are on station less than how many days? Students don't get a PCM. They don't get enrolled in Homeport if they are on board less than 179 days. What percentage of the provider team should be made up of civilians? What percentage of a provider team should be made up of civilians? 50%. 50% should be civilian. In a three provider team, how many of the providers have to be a physician? And then what are the maximum administrative discounts that team gets? All right, if you got a three provider team, one of them has to be a physician and they get 0.75 full-time equivalent for their administrative dis discount, okay? They get 0.75 FTE. And a four provider team, how many of the providers have to be physician? And then what is the maximum administrative discount the team gets? Two got to be physician and they get a 1.0 FTE administrative discount. Five provider team, how many physicians and what's the administrative discount? You've still got two physicians, but they get 1.25 FTE for the administrative discount. How many exam rooms are required per provider? How many exam rooms are required per provider? Each provider should have two exam rooms. All right, let's talk about some decedent affairs. Who is the Navy's and the Marine Corps' overall manager of the Deceit and Affairs Program? Who's the Navy and the USMC's overall manager of the Deceit and Affairs Program? That is Navy Casualty, Navy Mortuary Affairs. Who administers the Navy's Casualty Assistance Call Program? Who administers the Navy's Casualty Assistance Call Program? That's the Chief of Naval Operations Personnel Command, or PERS. PERS is where the Casualty Assistance Call Program is going to be administered. Who administers the Casualty Assistance Call Program for the USMC? The Casualty Assistance Call Program is managed by the Commandant of the Marine Corps, or administers. What are the Decedent Affairs Programs? You got your Current Death Program, your Graves Registration, your Concurrent Return Program, and your Returner Remains Program. Current Death, Graves, Concurrent Return, and then your Returner Remains. Which program is normally operational on a worldwide basis during peacetime? That's your current death program, operational on a worldwide basis during peacetime. Which program combines the current death and graves registration? A combination of current death and graves, that's your concurrent. Which program provides for the search, recovery, and evacuation to a temporary cemetery? Temporary cemeteries, that's your graves registration. Which program is activated upon enactment of special legislation and can establish permanent American cemeteries overseas? Right, enactment of special legislation and can establish permanent American cemeteries overseas. That's your return of remains. Which program provides for permanent disposition of remains of persons buried in temporary cemeteries who could not be evacuated under the current return program or the concurrent return program? That again is gonna be your return of remains. Which program is only operational when authorized by a responsible commander, and this is during major military operations? That's your graves registration. Within how many hours must a CO submit a casualty report? The CO's got to get a casualty report done in four hours, four hours. What method is used to submit a casualty report? We're going to use a priority message. Where do casualty reports get sent? Your casualty report's going to get sent to Commander Navy Personnel Command, so it's going to get sent to PERS, and it's going to get sent to Chief Bureau of Medicine and Surgery. It's going to get sent to BUMED. All right, so the casualty report sent to PERS and sent to BUMED. Between what hours should the personnel authorized direct disposition receive notification? We're going to notify the PAD between 05 and 2400. When a death occurs, CONUS. Who's responsible to make sure that personnel notification is made? Who is responsible to make sure that personal notification is made? That responsibility is the member's CO. When the death, uh, who will notify the designated casualty assistance call program regional headquarters when the death occurs? OCONUS. So who's going to make sure that the, the casualty assistance call program's um, notified when we were OCONUS? Well, that's going to be the job of Navy of PERS, of NAPERS command. Uh, COs are required to write a letter of condolence within how much time? COs are required to write a letter of condolence within how much time? They got to get that done in 48 hours. Where are the copies of the condolence letter going to be sent? Copies of the condolence letter are going to be sent to PERS and also to JAG. How frequently 
will progress reports be made to BUMED and Navy Casualty Office when the search and recovery operations uh, continue for more than 36 hours? How frequently will progress reports be made to BUMED and Navy Casualty Offices uh, when the search and recovery operations continue for more than 36 hours? It's going to be done every 24 hours. Annual contracts are awarded to funeral directors when an activity anticipates how many deaths a year. We're going to award annual contracts when we, have, we anticipate three or more deaths per year. What type of expenses are incurred in connection with the funeral and the burial of remains? The funeral and burial of remains, those are secondary expenses. What type of expenses are incurred in connection with the recovery, preparation, and the encasement of remains? Well, that's going to be a primary expense. At what temperature can remains be refrigerated to minimize cellular deterioration? At what temperature can remains be refrigerated to minimize cellular deterioration? We can, we can put them at 36 to 40 degrees. What form is a certificate of death overseas? Certificate of death overseas is your DD-2064. DD-2064. How many copies should accompany the remains? We're going to send three copies with the remains. What form is a statement of recognition? Your statement of recognition is your DD-565. And then how many copies of that are going to uh, go with the remains? We're going to send two 565s, two statements of, recommend, of recognition with the remains. What are the internal dimensions of a standard casket? Your standard casket should be 78 by 23 inches for your internal dimensions. What are the internal dimensions of an oversized casket? An oversized casket is going to be 81 by 25 inches. What, uh, how will the casket be labeled if the death was a result of a communicable disease? If somebody dies of a communicable disease, what do we got to do to the casket? We got to put a gum 2 by 4 label right at the head of it that is marked contagious. When inventorying personal effects of the deceased, how many people must be on the inventory board? Two people. What are the rank requirements? At least one of them's got to be a commissioned officer. What is the inventory going to be recorded on? The inventory is going to be recorded on the NAVSUP Form 29. NAVSUP 29. What type of expense is for when the remains are non-recoverable? If we can't recover the remains, we can do a memorial service expenditure. What form is the record and preparation and disposition of remains O CONUS? The, the uh, preparation and disposition of remains O CONUS is your DD 2062. What form is the record and preparation and disposition of remains CONUS? That's your DD 2063. Where do casualty reports get sent? Where do your casualty reports get sent? You're going to send one to PERS, and well, the CO, or the CO is going to send one to PERS, and one's going to get sent to ViewMed. Where are the copies of the condolence sent, letter sent? Condolence letter is going to be sent to NAPERSCOM and OJAG. What form is a certificate of death overseas? Your certificate of death overseas, that's going to be your DD-2064. What is a statement of recognition? That is your DD-565. What is the inventory recorded on? Your inventory is going to be recorded on your NAVSUP Form 29. What form is the record and preparation and disposition of remains O CONUS? O CONUS is your DD-2062. And then your uh, record of preparation and disposition for remains CONUS, that's your DD-2063. What is the report of medical history? What is the report of medical history? That is your DD-2807. What is the report of medical examination? Your medical examination is going to be done on a DD-2808. What is a report of medical assessment? The report of medical assessment, that's your DD-2697. 2697, 2697, your report of medical assessment. What form is the abbreviated temporary limited duty medical board and report? That's going to go on a NAVMED form, NAVMED 6100 slant 5. What form is the medical, dental, and educational suitability screening for service and family members? Your medical, dental, and educational suitability screening is going to get done on your NAVMED 1300 slant 1. What form is used to evaluate, or sorry, what is used to evaluate near visual acuity? What is used to evaluate near visual acuity? We use Jaeger cards. 
what can test both distant and near visual acuity and assist in evaluation of other optical conditions? Well, we can use an Armed Forces Vision Tester, an AFVT, to go ahead and test both distance and near and other optical conditions. What are the two methods of testing color vision the Navy has? The two methods we're going to use for color vision are we're going to use the Farnsworth Lantern Test or the Phalant, or we're going to use pseudo-isochromatic plates, your PIP plates. What is the preferred test for color vision? Well, that's your phalant, right? Your Farnsworth lantern test. What is your reference audiogram? Your reference audiogram is DD2215. Uh, what is the hearing conservation data form? That's your DD2216. That's the one you're going to get your annual audiogram done if you're on the hearing conservation, uh, in the hearing conservation program. What instruction is a suitability screening, medical assignment screening, and EFMP identification and enrollment? That is your BUMED instruction 1300.2 Bravo. What form is the medical, dental, and educational suitability screening for service members and family members? Again, that's NAVMED 1300 slant 1. What form is a medical, dental, educational suitability screening checklist and worksheet? That's your NAVMED 1300 slant 2. What form is the report of suitability for overseas assignment? That is your NAV PERS, right? A NAV PERS form 1300 slant 16. Because this one, the report of suitability for overseas assignment, that one's not just signed by medical, that's going to be signed by your CO. And that's the one that PERS is going to look at after they send you your overseas or your operational orders, orders to make sure that gets done. What form is a report of medical history? Your medical history, again, is done on a 2807. Uh, what form is the exceptional family member medical summary? What form is the exceptional family member medical summary? That's your DD-2792. What form is a special education slash early intervention summary? Special education or early intervention summary, that's going to be done on a DD-2792 TAC-1. How much time does a family member have to complete their suitability screening after receipt of orders or overseas notification? How much time does a family member have to get their operational or overseas screening done after receipt of orders? The family member gets 60 days. How much time does a service member have to complete their suitability screening after receipt of orders or overseas uh, notification? Well, they only get 30 days, right? Service member gets 30, family member gets 60. What is the rank requirement for your suitability screening coordinator? What is the rank requirement for your suitability screening coordinator? They've got to be an E6 and above. If the gaining command determines that they do not have the capabilities to support a service member, who do they submit the unsuitability recommendation to? Gaining command doesn't think they can support the member. They got to send the uh, recommendation to the TICOM surgeon's office. How many days does a gaining suitability screening coordinator have to reply to a suitability inquiry? So if we're here in the States, right, and we send an inquiry to an overseas location to their suitability screener, how many days do they have to answer? They've got seven days. How far must an MTF be away from the command before it's considered remote duty? How far does an MTF have to be away from a command before it's considered remote duty? A two hours drive in normal conditions. What services are designed to meet the physical, cognitive, communicative, social, and emotional needs of infants and toddlers? All right, that, uh, those services are called Early Intervention Services, EIS. What is a written plan uh, for preschool and school-age children that outlines a special education program that is uh, required to meet the needs of the student receiving the special education? The written plan for preschool and school-age children, that's the individual, Individualized Education Plan, the IEP. What is a written plan for the family of an infant or toddler receiving early intervention services? The written plan for the infant or toddler, that's going to be the individualized family service plan. Okay, so the written plan for your school age children, that's your individualized education plan. And then for your, uh, your infant or toddler, that's the individualized family service plan, your IFSP. Who makes the final determination if a, family, if a family member is unsuitable due to declining in immunization? Who's going to make the final determination if a family member is unsuitable due to declining immunizations? That's going to be a flag officer from BUMED Family Readiness. What is the minimum rank requirement for an EFMP coordinator? 
what is your minimum rank requirement for an EFMP coordinator? They're going to be an E5 and above. When should a post-pregnancy suitability screening be done on a dependent mother and newborn? Post-pregnancy suitability screenings, we're going to do those uh, eight weeks post-delivery. Within how many days must a transferring command administer a pregnancy test of a transferring service woman? They got to do that no more than 30 days. What form is the exceptional family member medical summary? Your exceptional family member medical summary is done on your DD-2792. Who must the gaining command notify if a screening deficiency is identified? Gaining command gets somebody and it turns out they should not right, have uh, got to the command. There, there's some sort of deficiency in the screening process. Well, they're going to let the parent command, the person who sent the, the, the sailor, and they also got to let BUMED family readiness know as well. Okay, this concludes this review session. As always, I, I hope this helps and keep studying.